Welcome to our online video series, Reading Hope in Trying Times. Our guest today is our good friend, Diana Butler Bass. Diana is an author, speaker, and independent scholar specializing in American religion and culture. She holds a PhD in religious studies from Duke University and is the author of many great books, including Grateful, The Transformative Power of Giving Thanks, and also Grounded, Finding God in the World, and the widely influential, influential book, Christianity After Religion, The End of Church and the Birth of a New Spiritual Awakening. Um, another best-selling book, Christianity for the Rest of Us, How the Neighborhood Church is Transforming the Faith, was named as one of the best religion books of the year by Publishers Weekly and was featured in a cover story on USA Today. Diana also writes at the Huffington Post, Washington Post, and comments on religion, politics, and culture in the media, including USA Today, Time, Newsweek, CBS, CNN, Fox, PBS, and NPR. She wrote a weekly column on American religion for the New York Times, and um, is a contributing editor for Sojourners Magazine, and has written widely in um, other religious press, such as Christianity Today, excuse me, Christian Century, Clergy Journal, and Congregations. She's taught at Westmont College, University of California at Santa Barbara, McAllister College, Rhodes College, and the Virginia Tech Theological Seminary. So welcome, Diana. Hey, Brian. It's good to be with you. Thank you for having me. Well, thanks for being here with us. It's wonderful to uh, be able to speak with you on uh, this, despite, you know, all the craziness going on. Yeah. Um, maybe you can tell us a little bit about how God's helped you through trying times and how that has been reflected in your books. Oh, well, in, in so many ways, uh, my, my books include memoir. And um, a lot of the stories that I tell do come out of difficulty. And I don't kind of know why it is that people, you know, think that writers have an easy life. You know, it's oftentimes we become writers because we're trying to deal with things that we don't really understand. And that we find our own life journey, you know, so complex that we begin to sort of unpack it, you know, with, with, uh, with words. And those experiences that we have become an invitation you know, to other people to think about their life experiences and, and what's hard for them. So throughout the whole gamut of my books, and I'm, I'm actually just finishing up a manuscript right now. It'll be my 11th book. It comes out in January uh, 2021, which is great. It's giving me something to think about in the future. Um, in all, in that whole arc of books, uh, people who have read my stuff for a long time uh, know about my experience of my first job and being fired and that I was previously married and had a really painful uh, divorce when I was in my 30s and uh, living in Washington, D.C. in the middle of 9-11. And it just there's a, there's a whole sort of series of emotional, personal, and public shocks, um, you know, that I've lived through in these, in my lifetime. I just turned uh, 60 this past year, and um, I've tried to share that. So, so a long way I've learned a thing or two, and I think that for me, the most exciting project that I did is sort of a, in some ways, a kind of a summary project of, of resiliency, is that, uh, the last book I wrote, the last one that was published, um, a book called Grateful, uh, The Subversive Practice of Giving Thanks. Um, that book really was a, a great learning experience for me. I was able to go back, look at, look at my own life, and rediscover, or maybe even in some cases, I think I sort of discovered it for the first time, what a significant practice gratitude has been on that whole journey and to pay more attention to it and to learn from my own experience with new depth and maturity and um, I wound up writing this book on gratitude mostly during 2016 and early 2017 uh, which meant I was writing it during the 2016 elections, and anybody who follows me on social media knows that I was not happy uh, with, the with the results of those elections, and um, then uh, wrote 
finished the book during the first 100 days that Donald Trump was president and how emotionally hard that was um, for me and, and um, what it brought up for me. And so, so this, so here I was writing a book about gratitude in a time when I felt least grateful uh, for the sort of the political environment in which I live. I, I do live outside of Washington. And um, the, how excited I had been, you know, hoping that a woman would become president of the United States and that didn't happen. And then beginning to see this sort of real rebirth of uh, public misogyny in our culture and, and the, the depths of racism that have always surrounded us, but I think it's made them, itself more clear. So all of this was going on and I'm writing a book about being grateful. So it was, it seemed like it was really out of place. And yet it was that book and that practice that began to bring my whole life back into focus. And um, after I wrote the book, I remember the first, when I sent it up to the, out to the publisher for the, when the first draft was done, it was on April 29th. Uh, 2017, I never forget the day, um, because it was the 100th day that Donald Trump was president. It was sort of interesting. And so my husband said to me when we sat down to dinner, he, he said, you know, you sent your book in on the 100th day Trump was president. And I said, I can't believe that. And he said, he looked at me really seriously and said, you know, I think writing that book saved you. Hmm. Wow. Yeah. And so. So that's really kind of what I was hoping to you know, share with people today um, about how even when you're, so 2017, I was, I guess, 59, 58. And, um, you know, even when you're approaching your 60th birthday, you know, <laughs> there's plenty that you have to learn and you can still um, really take on practices that can be transformative and take you to places you didn't know you needed to go and that it's and that those practices and those moments actually come I think more fully when we feel lost and, and so this is certainly another one of, of those moments so um, I know for a lot of us we go look back on situations and there's kind of like a little switch that's flipped you know, within our minds where, you know, we were either bent out of shape, mad about something or just in a dark place and the little flip switch will finally flip and we really put it into perspective, you know, and, and you in your book talk about, I think, several different instances, you know, different examples, different aspects of gratitude. Um, can you share one of those with us? Yeah, I, I think that the most... The hardest to talk about, and I think in some ways the one that was most activated uh, by Trump's presidency uh, was the issue of when I was uh, 14, I was sexually abused by a relative. And I was writing about that before the Me Too movement started. It was just when Trump had come onto the scene and, and I was very upset because, you know, I looked at him and I, I saw a, a man who clearly hates women and clearly sexualizes women. And I just thought to myself while I was working on gratitude that, or grateful, the original title was actually gratitude. Um, but while I was working on grateful, um, I, I began to think about how gratitude had fit in that circumstance, which was in some ways the worst thing. Uh, that ever happened to me, and it was it happened to me when I was so very young, and it it really set some trajectories in my life uh, for good and for ill um, that I've navigated, you know, over these decades. So I, I decided that telling my story would be an empowering thing, and that that women like myself who had been in positions where powerful men had used us for their own purposes, um, that one of the ways that we could regain power would be to stand up 
and say, you know, you don't get the last word about this. I'm not going to sit in some corner and be ashamed of this story because this is, this is, I, I was, I was the victim. And what happens to this story, you, I'm not going to get, let you have the last word. And so, so it was the first time I'd ever written about that. It was the first time I ever talked about it in public. And people had, who have read the book have actually asked me public questions about it. And um, the way that gratitude fit into it was really interesting as I explored that moment um, and its, its ramifications through my life. And, and that was one of the things people had told me along the way, especially a lot of church people. When I, when I had told, told pastors or friends that this had happened to me, and I, I feel lucky because in college I was part of a really great group of young women, and a number of them had been abused. And we all shared our stories with each other. And so I, I had never really kept it such a secret that it could – completely eat me alive. There was always safe places for me to go with a story. But when I had told a story in even the safest of settings, there would always be someone who would say something to the effect of, you know, well, you have to really just let it go. You have to forgive him. And you have to, you know, give thanks in all things, quoting uh, from Thessalonians. And uh, boy, that made me mad. <laughs> You know, it was like, you know, the, some things are so terrible. You just, you can't demand forgiveness of people and nor can you demand gratitude. And um, so, you know, I, I struggled with both of those things for years. You know, what does it mean to forgive someone that you really, in effect, don't want to forgive? And what does it mean um, to live a grateful life for all things? Um, and and uh, the first one, forgiveness, that actually for me was a little easier than gratitude. Um, it, it might be different. I'm sure it's different for other people. But uh, I just kind of kept working on it. You know, I just kept telling myself that I didn't want to be eaten by bitterness. I didn't want to become the person. I didn't want to become an ugly person as the result of an ugly thing that was done to me, you know? And so, so I, I, I mean, I kept, I kept just living with it for a long time in ways that I went through it. And then I, I literally woke up one morning and felt an enormous amount of compassion uh, for my, for my uncle who is dead. And, um, I didn't expect that. And while it wasn't really like, oh, I forgive you, there was a kind of a, a moment of deep understanding of how wounded uh, we truly all are. And that in that woundedness, uh, we all have the option to make choices. And he chose some really horrible things. And um, I, all of a sudden, when I got to that point, I realized, oh my gosh, you know, there are terrible things that have happened to me too, and that by and large, the choices that I have made out of those terrible things have been more compassionate and more loving than they might have otherwise been. And so it was like a surprise. It was like a, it was, it was like a surprise to myself that all of a sudden I could even find compassion for him. And in that I found a new compassion for myself and I felt free, and, but that didn't happen until I was like 53 years old. <laughs> so, you know, it was a long process, but, but even after that gratitude was still kind of hard. It was like, you know, really why, you know, why should I feel grateful? This is, this makes no sense. Be thankful in all things, you know? And um, while I was working on this book, uh, that kept coming back to that verse in Thessalonians, in all things give thanks. And for the first time, you know, when I really looked at it, I went, oh my gosh, it doesn't say for all things give thanks. It says in all things give thanks. And that little word that we translate in, um, E-N in Greek, um, means the, the, the Greek meaning of that in the New Testament is 
through all things give thanks. Um, and yet we sort of have popularized that in our mind saying for all things give thanks. And so that, you know, I heard people say, oh, you should give thanks for everything that happens in your life. And while I was doing that little bit of Greek analysis, writing this book about gratitude, I went, no, we don't give thanks for all things. Because some things are lousy and evil and wrong and sinful and violent and unjust and oppressive and everything else. And we give no thanks for those things. But we can give thanks through those things. And that thanks, gratitude becomes one of the pathways that helps that journey toward a fuller life towards forgiveness, towards real compassion, towards empathy, towards self-acceptance, towards love of neighbor. As we take gratitude on that journey with us through the pain, we can get to another place. And so that was probably the most dramatic thing that I learned and I wrote about in, in the book. And in the book, I do it for people who might want to pick it up and who feel like that oh my gosh I can't read that that would be triggering I get that um, I wrote about it rather sparingly um, the prose there is uh, clear but not graphic in any way and just sort of takes people on a little bit of the journey that I went through to in the most I think um, delicate of ways uh, because I know that this is really painful territory for people who share these experiences. So, well, I think that distinction about you know give thanks through all things is really incredibly important, and mm -hmm. uh, and and one incarnation of that is give thanks despite all things, right? You know, or despite some things anyway. <laughs> yeah, well, it, it, and it's perfect for right now because you know there's I'm not going to be thankful for. A global pandemic you know I'm not going to be thankful for uh, the coronavirus you know this is it's really frightening people are have died and families have been broken there's people across the planet who are mourning um, we're all feeling very afraid and that's not worth giving thanks for this is a this is a these kinds of viruses and medical crises and you know, this is part of the brokenness and the woundedness of our world. This is part of its disorder. So I, I don't give thanks for that. But if we can give thanks as we're going through it, um, that could be a gift. Um, and so well, I hope I hope you also take solace in the fact that so many people that have read that you know, part of your story and, and the entire part of your story are grateful for you having done that. I so, got wonderful it, response from that. So yeah, that so you've generated, that, you've generated a lot of gratitude and, and gratefulness, you know, on the part of others, right? You know, because of, you know, the, the pain that you went through, the difficulty in, you know, writing about it and everything, and, and but the fact that you did. So, you know, I, I hope that that's, you know, meaningful for you too. It, re it really is, and it has been surprising in the last two years since the book came out how many uh, notes I've gotten uh, to that regard. And that's the power of our stories. You know, it's the power of not letting a story about our own lives frighten us to such a point that we hide away. But when we, you know, when we navigate those stories, I mean, that's part of what I love about being a writer um, is that there's a there's an actual bond that develops between the author and the words that she puts on the page and then the words and the person who's reading those words. And it can be a place of, of real connection, of a, of a surprising relationship, and it can provide healing and joy. And I've, I feel really fortunate uh, that people tell me that. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I think 
the things that you do, you know, have had an impact, right? A positive impact on a lot of people. And that's worth a lot of good gratitude from us all. <laughs> well, thank you. Thanks. I, you know, it can be a really lonely life, you know, writing. You just sit alone a lot. And, um, you know, so uh, I, the, the, this whole business about being uh, socially distant, I had just spent six months writing a book. And the thing I was looking forward to most about this spring was my, my I'm an extrovert naturally. And so writing is actually very hard for me. Um, and so my editor had said, oh, oh, Diana, just wait, you're almost out of writer jail. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, all you have to do is finish your book and, and you'll be back in society. And so I went out and I did two events and then this happened. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> Perfect timing, right? So it's like, wait a second, I didn't have my full fill of extra version. And, um, and, and so it's, huh. It's a, this is a hard hard year. I feel like I've already been socially isolated for six months, but um, but that's nice of you to say because that reminds me of the importance of this kind of work. And so I'm just going to keep going on with it, and um, you know, hope that we find ways of connecting with one another that that really do um, give us real opportunity uh, to be grateful for being alive and um, grateful for these interesting technologies. I mean, can you imagine what it must have been like to quarantine in the 19th century or something? You know? No it, phone, no TV, no internet, no nothing. <laughs> really? Just some guy coming out th through your town yelling, bring out your dead, you know? And um, you wouldn't know anything. And, and so as quarantine goes you know the at least right now we have these wonderful tools that we can share with one another and um you know, see each other's faces and hear voices and still be friends and that's i'm, I'm grateful for those things right now so diana i know you also have some uh, bullet points you want to share with uh, our audience about some perspectives on why gratitude is good in these times right now. Yeah, um, I, I look forward to being with you because um, it's great to share a story and it's great to share, you know, a really important and personal story, you know, something I've written about and I hope is meaningful to people. But it's, it's also really good to think that gratitude is more than just saying thank you. You know, gratitude is actually a practice of being able to see the gifts of life and to realize all that we're surrounded by on a daily basis um, that sustains us. Um, and so, so it's a disposition that we develop. And so it's more than just somebody doing something nice for you and you saying thank you. It's actually a way of looking at the world um, and so there's this part of a lecture that I do, um, it's not in the book, and I, but I actually love it. It's one of my very favorite things is uh, there's a professor at UC Davis. His name is Robert Emmons, E-M-M-O-N-S. And um, he has four, four points of what is good about gratitude. And I just wanted to run through them really quickly because I think that right now, uh, people will find this beneficial and it's a real encouragement to pursue uh, gratefulness as a spiritual practice. And the first one is, um, is that uh, gratitude allows for the celebration of the present. And, and I think that's a really interesting thing is that almost all of my anxiety uh, comes from thinking about the past and what I did wrong, <laughs> what I regret, what I wish I would have done, uh, or something that was beautiful in the past that I don't have anymore. It's like, oh, if I could just go back to recently, I've been thinking about how much I liked the 1990s, you know. Um, but all of that sort of regret and nostalgia um, that doesn't really make you very happy. 
it makes you kind of sad and sort of difficult to live with actually. And then the other thing that um, is emotionally difficult, at least for me, is to think too much about the future. And um, my, my personality is such that I love thinking about the future. I'm kind of a dreamer. I love imagining. I'm very intuitive. I love thinking about what's coming. Um, but if you go out there too much, you go out there too far, you think, oh, how are we going to get there? Or, you know, especially right now, oh my gosh, you know what? turning 60 and then looking at the stock market and thinking about retirement funds. I mean, that's not fun to think about. I mean, it's like, how am I going to survive when I'm 65 if this doesn't pass? And so, you know, you start thinking about the future, what's hanging ahead, and that can be a very anxiety producing. <clears throat> so if we think about the past, we think about the future too much and in ways that are not life-giving, either through regret or kind of like, what am I going to do with myself? Um, both of those take us out of gratitude because we're, we've got all these toxic emotions going. Whereas gratitude, if you can just say, okay, what am I grateful for today? What am I grateful for right now? Um, all of a sudden, you know, I'm alive. Um, I can see the daffodils out the window of my little cottage where I write. Um, my family's all home and we're, we're not sick. And so there's three things right there. And as soon as I start thinking of those three things, my whole life recenters right here and now. And I just, I feel so much better. And so gratitude allows for celebration of the present. And, and so I really encourage people as a, as a disposition to practice, if you can kind of bring it here and now, that's going to really help. Um, then Eamon says the second piece is that gratitude blocks toxic emotions. And so I just gave you an example of that with the first point is that regret, despair, sadness, nostalgia, or fear and anxiety those all kind of get put in their proper places if you're practicing gratitude. And there's a whole lot of research that shows how gratitude actually blocks envy, resentment, regret, depression, fear, um, because gratitude lives in this wonderful part of our head that's the more evolved part of our heads, our frontal neocortex, lobe, that part of our head. I'm not a scientist, but you, you probably heard this in brain science too. And these negative emotions tend to live in our back part of our brain, or what people call the reptilian brain. And so um, gratitude blocks that transmission from the reptilian brain to the front of the brain. If you're practicing gratitude, all this negative stuff can't take over your whole head. And um, I love that because that means that the negative emotions, you'll feel them. Don't deny them. All, all of us are feeling these negative emotions right now. But the trick is, is to hold them in the proper context of our lives and to be able to think with more of the frontal cortex, which is gratitude, empathy, compassion, reason, all that kind of stuff. We need those things desperately right now. And so how do we keep activating the fronts of our brains to navigate through this really difficult time? Well, gratitude is a practice that helps to, helps that to happen. Uh, third, grateful people are more stress resilient. Stress is, gratitude does not get rid of stress. Gratitude is not a magic pill where stress disappears. But, but if you're practicing gratitude, you have, it's like one more tool in your toolkit to uh, live a more balanced life and not let stress become everything. And that's really important for your immune system because people who are stressed out get sicker. And so everything we can do right now to mitigate the worst effects of all of this stress is going to help us stay healthier. And, and gratitude is part of, of that package. And then finally, gratitude, um, this fourth point is gratitude strengthens social ties and self-worth. 
And so right now you may be locked in your basement on the internet, like, you know, basically I am. Um, but the truth of the matter is, is that you're still worth something, is that you're a human being, you have worth, um, your worth is not your job or your stock market portfolio or any of these things that we sort of get our brains all wrapped up into. Your worth is your worth, your existence, your life, your dignity, the fact that you are loved. Um, gratitude reminds us of that, that your life matters. And that is a significant thing to hold on to right now. And then finally, gratitude, this is actually part of the fourth one. Gratitude is about our self-worth. And when we feel like we're worth something, that causes us to more easily be able to reach out to others. And so social ties right now are fraying because of this horrible experience. But I, I do think that if we can hold on to a sense of our self-worth and we are grateful people, that it's going to cause us to be able to reach out and figure out how we can help others, even in a time when social ties are diminishing um, otherwise. And so, you know, maybe we'll come out in another two, three, six months, whatever it is, and we're going to have a whole different sense of what it means to be neighbors, what it means to be community, what it means to be Americans, what it means to be global citizens. And so maybe our social ties will be strengthened in ways that we can't even begin to imagine right now, even though we're social distancing. So that's it. The good of gratitude. Gratitude allows celebration of the present, even when it seems like the present is pretty scary and grim. Gratitude blocks toxic emotions. Gratitude, great, grat gratitude makes you more stress resilient. And gratitude deepens your sense of self-worth and social ties. It's not magic, but it's, uh, a great practice uh, to help you get through hard times. Wow, how useful. <laughs> yeah, isn't that great? I love that. It's, and it's, how applicable. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> I've, I've done actually an entire hour on, the, on those four points in, sure. in rooms and churches and community centers and colleges. And, and people come out and they go, wow, you know, I never really thought about that. And, um, you know, I never... I never did either until I wrote this book, and uh, I learned a lot uh, writing it from wonderful people, and it grew from, you know, my own experience of, of going through life and trying to figure out how gratitude fit into uh, moments of real crisis, um, and some of it I could figure out on my own, and some of it I had to, you know, bury myself in other people's books and discover things that I never uh, had. No well, before. your your point number two helps me understand my little tool that I use to get to sleep at night some of the time. If I'm having trouble getting to sleep, I think of things I'm grateful for. Oh, absolutely. Uh, and I have, this is a simple, crazy thing uh, that I do. You know, sometimes people ask me, what do you do to stay grateful? I have a little stone it's a it's it's a i don't have it with me down here in my office but it's a little river rock you know one of those things you can just sort of hold sure sure yeah the palm of your hand and it's it's white and it has the word gratitude engraved on it and i just bought it you know on amazon and um i put that little stone next to my bed and so what happens is when i go to sleep at night the last word i see is gratitude and when I wake up in the morning, the first word I see is gratitude. And sometimes when I'm, you know, I'm reaching for my phone in the morning, I turn my alarm off, I don't even find my phone. My hand will hit the stone first. <laughs> and, and so I'll think to myself, oh my gosh, that's the gratitude stone. I'm alive. It's a new day. And the other night, honestly, I was awake until four in the morning. Um, I kept, I, I, I couldn't fall asleep and then I fell asleep and I kept waking up and I was just so worried about everything. And, um, I, I took this stone and I, I, I held it in my hand and it was so cold because it had just been sitting there in the, you know, the, the cold of the, the night. And I just held it and kept thinking what I was grateful for. I just made a little list and, and it was interesting. The more I, I held it, of course, and the longer my list got, the warmer the stone got. And so by the time 
the stone was warm, I was like breathing more easily. And I finally did fall asleep. And um, I woke up about three hours later and uh, faced the day. And I had some very important decisions to make. And I, I, it surprised me, but every single one of those decisions went better than I thought it was going to at, when I had been so worried at four o'clock in the morning. And so I think that's one of the things we all have to figure out how to do right now is to find those places to really, you know, hold, hold what is good and be grateful for it and to breathe more easily and to give ourselves the space um, to do the right thing and give the people around us the space to do the right thing as well. That's kind of some of the things I'm hoping for. Out of well, excellent. Weeks. This has been, um, I think, exactly what I hoped for when I came up with this idea to do this series, you know, is be able to provide people with perspectives on, you know, how to help get through these trying times. Yeah. And so this has been, you know, I think very enjoyable and very useful for folks. And I really appreciate you uh, spending the time, Diana, to uh, convey this to our audience. Yeah, I do have one final little thing. If if people want to pursue this as a practice, there are wonderful books, not just mine, that you can get online. I urge people to try to shop uh, through independent bookstores right now. Um, Amazon has slowed down book deliveries in favor of delivering, you know, medical supplies and food. Uh, so Barnes & Noble independent bookstores are going to be your best choices for getting good books quickly. Um, also, um, you can go to my website. You know, everybody always says, go to my website. I'm not running for political office. But um, I have this little thing on my website. It's a seven-day guide to gratitude. And it's free. It's just a gift for you. Um, and all you need to do is, if you go to uh, my website, which is www.dianabutlerbass.com, and you click on the book, grateful that says it says order here just click on that and it takes you over to a page and and on that page there's a little link that says resources for studying grateful so click on the resource link and there's a whole bunch of free stuff on that page to strengthen your practice of gratitude including this seven day guide you just download this and i wrote this it has prayers in it it has little snippets of things that I wrote in the book. It has exercises to do. And it gives you kind of like a seven-day gratitude boot camp. And there's, it's absolutely, it's just a gift. It's, it's just a gift from me to you. And um, I hope that great gratitude will help get you through these days. Well, well thank you, Diane. I'll include a link to that in oh, the you know, video that we put online, as well as the page that lists all of these um, seminars. So thank you for that. Yeah. Well, right, well I, I just want everyone to, to make it. Yeah, you know, I want people I to be you. healthy and strong and stay true to the things that mean the most to your heart. And whatever we can do to help each other is uh, a wonderful thing. So, so thank you again for helping a lot of people today. Oh, thanks. Thanks for having me. All right. Bye now. Bye-bye.